Hello again, everybody in Fine Arts 109, popping in for our next round of video lectures and building directly off of uh, the time period we had talked about previously, which was the new Hollywood moment back in the 1960s and 1970s. Um, when I was finishing up that uh, lecture last week, I'd mentioned that a lot of the names that break through in that time period, maybe most famously Steven Spielberg, uh, Martin Scorsese, but also figures like George Lucas, uh, Woody Allen, Roman Polanski, are still pretty active members of the Hollywood filmmaking community. Uh, Scorsese himself was just nominated for an Oscar this past year uh, for directing The Irishman, and Spielberg still cranks out so many movies I actually lose count of them. Like, multiple times he's released two movies on the very same day. It's been a couple of years, I think, since his last one, The Post, uh, but Spielberg is still a highly prolific filmmaker. Uh, and I think he actually symbolizes best, better than anyone, uh, how Hollywood changes after that artistic moment, the shakeup in the corporate culture, popular culture, and then the new voices that emerge in the 1960s and 70s, because some of those new voices create a new template for how the movie studios in Hollywood can make money. And it's really Steven Spielberg and George Lucas, who are uh, pretty good friends of one another, who create that template for how Hollywood can move forward. And that is through the blockbuster. Uh, this is probably a term that you've heard before, a blockbuster movie. Uh, the term itself, actually, I always love etymology. That's the study of where words come from, the origins of our words. Uh, the term blockbuster just has to do with how movie tickets used to be collected. If you went to a movie theater, you'd buy a ticket, they tore it in half, uh, and they stuck the theater half into a usually a plastic or glass box that was in the box office that's where movie tickets were sold and then collected uh and if a movie was so popular it overflowed the box it was a block buster there you go most movie theaters aren't exactly doing that sort of thing these days but the term persists because what it comes to symbolize is not just you sold so many movie tickets that it's flowing out of the box it comes to symbolize a certain type of of popular film, an extremely popular film at that. Um, blockbuster movies are ones that have high budgets. Uh, these days, uh, we, we're still making blockbuster movies, of course, and these days a typical blockbuster budget easily runs into the hundreds of millions of dollars, something like Avengers Endgame, uh, which came out about this time a year ago. Uh, if you add up the cost of the production and the cost of the marketing, uh, Disney probably spent something like $600 million, maybe more, in order to release Avengers Endgame into theaters last April. That is a titanic amount of money to spend on just one movie, of course. Um, and you'll recall that that sort of thing had gotten studios in trouble in the past. Cleopatra and Paint Your Wagon back in the 1960s had nearly bankrupted uh, 20th Century Fox and Paramount simply because they cost so much money that it was almost impossible to recoup that investment at the box office. Uh, the studios nearly went out of business because they had invested so much in just one film. Uh, studios can still suffer huge losses when it comes to trying to produce blockbusters. Disney is not immune to this. Uh, about seven, eight years ago now, they made an animated film. It's one of those creepy, like, live recordings, and then they paste the CGI on top of the movies. Um, it was called Mars Needs Moms, and apparently Disney lost $100 million, maybe more, producing that movie because it was a complete flop at the box office, and they just had to eat the lost money from the producing and marketing and releasing it. So blockbusters can bomb and a series of bombs at the box office uh, failures can certainly cripple a movie studio's ability to thrive. But typically blockbusters do not bomb because they have a rather built-in audience. That's actually one of the key features of uh, what the textbook calls the blockbuster mentality. Something like paint your wagon back in the 1960s, that was a gamble. It was a gamble that there was a big audience for Westerns, which was still pretty popular in the 1960s, especially Clint Eastwood Westerns, like uh, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, and that there was a big audience for mega musicals, which there was a big audience for those. Movies like The Sound of Music uh, made an enormous pile of money back in 1965. And they thought, well, we'll blend those together into a mega Western musical. 
there was not an audience for that. People who liked Sergio Leone's uh, spaghetti westerns were not the same people who liked uh, Hollywood mega musicals in the Broadway style. And so nobody was happy. Nobody went to see the movie. Paramount loses its shirt and gets bought by an oil refining company. Uh, that is something where you rarely see gambles like that any longer because beginning in the 1970s uh, and then uh, really solidifying in the 1980s, there is a very typical model for making a blockbuster film that Hollywood goes back to every time they want to make a bucket full of money. And the, the two movies that really originate this style are released uh, within about a year and a half of one another, maybe two years. Uh, you have the release of Jaws, which is directed by Steven Spielberg back, back in 1975. It's a thriller about a community haunted by a killer great white shark in, uh, I think it's in Massachusetts. Uh, famously, <laughs> uh, the mayor from Jaws doesn't want to close the beaches because it would hurt tourism, but the shark keeps killing people in that. That Mayor from Jaws has been referenced a fair number of times in the news recently for reasons. We'll just say for reasons. But that movie was widely popular. If you've ever seen Jaws, and it is one of the potential screenings, it's uh, thrilling, it's terrifying, it's entertaining, it's got great characters, it's got excitement uh, and adventure. It's, it's just a really, really well-crafted film. Uh, and audiences loved it. It was the highest grossing movie of 1975. I think in turn, if you don't adjust for inflation, Jaws was briefly the highest grossing movie ever released. It People couldn't get enough of it. Uh, that record, for all that money made, gets surpassed very shortly thereafter by George Lucas's Star Wars. Star Wars is uh, maybe just as much as Jaws, a template for modern blockbusters. It is a uh, it's obviously one of those, Star Wars is so familiar at this point, so deeply baked into American popular culture, that I always kind of adore just how strange it is when you try to describe it like nobody's ever seen it before. It is a genre called space opera, science fiction, uh, where it's sort of operatic, mythological characters and settings set in outer space uh, in a galaxy far, far away uh, a long time ago, famously as the opening credits say. Um, and it's about a what is Luke Skywalker? Luke Skywalker is uh, a moisture farmer on a desert planet who winds up uh, winds up getting a message inadvertently from a uh, intergalactic princess that she's in help and needs uh, Obi Wan Kenobi, and, uh, and then that launches him on an adventure trying to save the princess with the help of a space pirate named Han Solo, a space wizard named Obi Wan Kenobi, two helpful robots, only one of whom can speak English, uh, and uh, an evil, menacing figure in black plastic named Darth Vader, uh, and this monstrous weapon that Vader uh, helps control called the Death Star, which can uh, explode an entire planet with one shot. Um, it's a, it's a, it genuinely, it's a fantastic movie. It's thrilling. It's a lot of fun. Uh, and if you haven't watched it in a long time, it's worth rewatching the original Star Wars. Uh, it, you can still, I remember I, I watched it, I was probably eight or so, I would say, when I first watched Star Wars, maybe nine. It was the most thr thrilling thing I had ever seen. Um, I'm, I'm not one of those people who is so obsessed with that feeling that I, very angry that later Star Wars movies don't replicate it for me, he said to the YouTube comments about The Last Jedi, which is a good movie. Uh, but that template, this thrilling, character-driven, but also spectacle, action-heavy, special effects-heavy uh, action-adventure uh, action film, that is the model for blockbuster filmmaking, especially uh, if you have big names attached to it. When they made Star Wars, the biggest star was Alec Guinness, who played Obi-Wan Kenobi, but that movie made movie stars, most notably, uh, took Harrison Ford from a guy who still had to work as a, I think he was a carpenter, a part-time carpenter, and turned him into arguably the biggest movie star of the 1980s and 1990s. Um, and that is something that Hollywood realizes there's a ton of money to be made. Star Wars didn't cost a lot to produce. Its sequels cost a lot to produce. The Empire Strikes Back, Return of the Jedi, and then the later prequel trilogy, which is garbage, and the uh, more recent films, which are fine. Yeah, fine. The Last Jedi is good. The others are fine. Um, but what they realize is that with The Empire Strikes Back, the second Star Wars movie, or with Jaws 2, which comes out just a couple of years later, with Rocky 2, which comes out 
four years after the original Rocky. Um, there is a built-in audience. If you shatter box office records with Star Wars, why not make a sequel? And all the people who loved the first one will presumably want to buy a ticket for the second one, maybe see it again. The Empire Strikes Back didn't make as much money as the original Star Wars, but it more, made more than enough money to justify the cost of pr producing it and producing another sequel, The Return of the Jedi. That is what really sets the model there. You produce a hit film, or you just take a property that is already popular and turn it into a movie, and then you can create basically an endless number of sequels and spin-offs, all of which have a relatively guaranteed level of popularity because people already like Star Wars, or Jaws, or Indiana Jones, or Batman, or Superman. The number of movies tied into those five franchises, all of which launched end of the 1970s, early 1980s, I think you would run to about 25 movies? About five, no, that's, that can't be right. It's probably even more, probably over 30 movies produced by just those same couple of franchises in the past 40 years here. That is an enormous income stream. If you are 20th Century Fox, the original distributor of Star Wars, Star Wars is uh, probably a co-production between Fox and Lucasfilm, George Lucas's uh, company. You make a relatively big investment in producing and marketing this movie, but you also know that you've got sequels and you've got this huge built-in audience and increasingly beginning in the 1980s, you've got VHS, which lets people buy a copy of this and enjoy it at home. You've got cable TV, which is becoming more and more prominent in the 1980s. You can sell the rights to Star Wars so people can watch it on HBO or on uh, AMC or whatever other channel wants to show it. And why wouldn't they want to show it? People love watching these movies. Put it on TV, you'll make a ton of money. Uh, this creates, just from the movie itself, multiple revenue streams. One Star Wars movie back in 1977 makes hundreds of millions of dollars. Add in all of the sequels, all of the different ways of distributing it at home and on television. Billions, countless billions in the past 45 years here. Uh, and that's actually only one part of it. Movies like Star Wars, they are just one piece of an overall marketing scheme. Star Wars has enormous numbers of tie-ins, uh, spin-offs toys, stuff like that. The toys, especially. It was literally for Star Wars toys that the term action figure was invented. Prior to that, uh, male-oriented uh, toys like that were still called dolls, but you can't have a Luke Skywalker doll, so action figure is the term that's made up. All of this is um, enormously uh, enormously profitable. Uh, Star Wars itself it, it brings in an incredible amount of money, an absolutely incredible amount of money. And uh, that is enough, even if you don't produce that many other movies, just that income stream justifies the expense and it justifies all of your other expenses as well. This becomes what's known as the tentpole approach to making movies. You get one or two blockbusters a year. They make so much money that it, just, it, it covers the costs of the eh, 12 other movies you might produce that year. They don't have to be hits at that size because all of that money from Star Wars or from Indiana Jones or from Batman is, you know, baked right into your revenue stream. All right, I got to pause really quickly. Uh, I need to help with the kids upstairs. Be right back. All right, so hopping back into things, uh, part of the reason this sort of blockbuster filmmaking becomes so popular in these decades is because there's yet another shift in ownership uh, that we start to see in Hollywood. We had already seen back in the 60s, the studios were mostly bought out by other businesses. They just became parts of larger conglomerates. What you start to see happen more and more in the 1980s, it really kicks off in the 1980s and then accelerates in the 90s, is that Hollywood studios don't go independent once again, but they do become part of a new type of corporate corporation. Essentially, Hollywood studios become focal points, the, kind of the, the key piece, in larger multimedia corporations. So instead of Paramount being owned by a oil company, it's now owned by Viacom, which also owns CBS television and a whole bunch of cable channels. Uh, and so Paramount Pictures and then the TV and cable side of the business, they are joined together. They're producing things for maybe not the exact same audience, but they are clearly related businesses here. You see the same thing with uh, 20th Century Fox that's bought by a man named Rupert Murdoch, uh, who had uh, begun a news media empire back in the 
50s or 60s in Australia, but he eventually makes so much money that he can take all of this Australian and British money and just buy a movie studio in the United States and then use that brand, Fox, to launch his own TV network, to, to eventually launch a news channel, all of that sort of thing. Um, maybe most famously in this time period, you see one of the old, old Hollywood studios, Warner Brothers, merge with Time Incorporated, one of the major news media outlets in the country, publishing Time Magazine, People Magazine, Sports Illustrated. Those two uh, businesses join together, and they include the movie studio. They also include the largest television production company in the country, Warner Brothers T Television, HBO, the premier premium cable network in the country all of those magazines and newspapers affiliated with Time, as well as a major cable subscription service, Time Warner Cable. All of this is a process that is reinventing how much money you can make in the, in Hollywood. If you recall, uh, up until the 1940s, Hollywood had been vertically integrated. Production, distribution, and exhibition were all controlled by the studio. Beginning in the 1980s, corporations uh, start to move to a model called horizontal integration. Instead of controlling all up and down of one revenue stream, you can control major components of a bunch of related revenue streams. So look at, for example, Batman, which is released by Warner Brothers Pictures in 1989, and maybe as much as Jaws and Star Wars, the original Batman movie is the perfect example of blockbuster mentality here. It's based on pre-existing property. People have been reading and loving Batman comics for 50 years by the time that movie is made. It's got some pretty famous names uh, in it. Michael Keaton played Batman. Kim Bassinger played uh, the female lead. Jack Nicholson plays the Joker. I'll be right back, kids. All right, picking up again. So Batman, old popular character, hasn't had a serious movie made about him before. Uh, starring major actors of the 1980s, Michael Keaton, Kim Bassinger, Jack Nicholson, maybe the most famous actor of the 70s and 80s, um, arguably arguably the most famous movie star in the past half century that Hollywood's had. Uh, so you've got big names. You've got a well-known character. It's an action movie. It's an adventure movie. It's directed by Tim Burton, an upcoming filmmaker who seems to have a lot of potential. And it's being produced and released by Warner Brothers, so which means that they can cross-promote it with all of the other aspects of this new Time Warner Corporation. Tie-in books and comics can be published through DC. Uh, there's promotion that can be covered by Time Magazine and its affiliates. It can be promoted through Time Warner's uh, cable affiliates. All of this, and, and that doesn't even cover, like, toys and games and all of that sort of stuff. All of that means that Batman itself is just one part of a colossal corporate push to maximize revenue and profit based on just one movie. That is the model for blockbusters in, in many ways, even down to the present day. You can really look at something like the way Disney produces its animated films, its uh, Marvel films, its Star Wars films. They are just doing a very big copy-paste of what Warner Brothers did with Batman back in the 1980s. Warner Brothers still does that with Batman today. Uh, so all of that creates the blockbuster world that we're still living in today, one that has changed to some degree since the 1970s, but that template of tentpole blockbusters starring big names that can be exported all around the world because they rely on spectacle and action and adventure, that's still what Hollywood is trying to make most of its money from. Maybe that's not what they consider art, but that is what they try to make their revenue from. All right, I will see you all next week.